peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair and cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted even me, when nothing else can help, love lifted me. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to online worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. My name is Kim, I'm the pastor here, and what a joy it is to gather to worship God together this day. Quick announcement, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper today and all are welcome at the table. If you have not yet done so, um, please just take a minute to run into your kitchen and gather together some elements. Could be bread or crackers, um, anything along those lines. Might be a cup of juice or wine, even a cup of water would be fine. But we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, toward the end of the service, so you do have a little bit of time to gather those things together if you have not done so. And now let us begin our worship service. All of the words that you will need for today's service will appear on your screen as you need them. The words to the hymns, the responsive readings, the prayers, all of it, so you can worship uh, loudly and passionately as you would like to. We will begin with our call to worship. Live in God's love. Let that love be poured out for all God's people. Bring hope and peace to all whom you meet. We are called to be God's witnesses. Celebrate and rejoice. Praise be to God who has called, healed, and given us a ministry of peace. Amen. And let us now go into a time of confession. We'll pray first silently, 
and then we'll pray together in the prayer found on your screen. Let us pray. And let us pray together. Lord of mercy, there are so many times in our lives when we feel alone. We wonder where you are. We cry out to you in our confusion, pain, and hurt, not because we're seeking your presence, but because we're seeking your solutions. And when you do not immediately grant the prayers of our cries, we begin to doubt that you even care or exist. Stop us from going down this path of self-destruction. Help us look around and find the many ways in which you have blessed our lives. Forgive us when we are so quick to doubt and so arrogant in our demands of your responses. Give us a spirit of patience and willingness to be ready to hear your voice. Strengthen us for the ministries of love and hope that you have placed before us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Even in the midst of doubt and darkness, the light of God is shining in you, on you, and through you. Out of God's great love, we have been redeemed and made whole. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Before we hear God's written word, let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, how we thank you for this morning, for this time where we can gather together, one body of Christ, one community of faith, in many different places, in different homes, and viewing on different devices, and yet we're singing the same songs of praise and hope. We are praying the same words. We are hearing the same scriptures. We are worshiping the one true God. And Lord, as we worship today, we pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, opening our ears, our hearts, and our minds, so that we hear your written word and recognize your voice and understand your message. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and, the two, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. 
He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. see Jesus once again showing himself to his disciples. This is the third time he has appeared to his disciples. Uh, and then there was the time, of course, Easter morning that he appeared to Mary. After he appeared to Mary that morning, remember he then appeared to all of the disciples as they hid in a locked room 
Fearful, wondering what was happening next, he came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, not all of the disciples were there. Of course, Thomas was missing. We talked about Thomas last week. He was not there and refused to believe until he could see it for himself. And Jesus appeared to Thomas and the disciples a week after the first time. He appeared again and told Thomas, reach out your hand, touch my hands, put your hand in my side and believe. Now he is appearing again and not quite in a recognizable form. They didn't know who he was at first. So where are they? They're by the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee or Lake Galilee. Only in John's Gospel is it called the Sea of Tiberias. It's about 80 miles north. So after they've had the events of Good Friday and Easter morning after they've seen Jesus in their locked room. They have now gone north 80 miles. It doesn't tell us anything about the journey or even how they decided to go. But the disciples are back home on their home turf, 80 miles north of Jerusalem. What's next? They must have been asking. What's next? Jesus comes in. He shows himself. He's resurrected. He is risen. He is alive. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. What now? What do we do next? We've all been in those times of transition where we know there's something we are supposed to be doing. We are sure that there is a next step, but we just aren't maybe sure what to do or how to get there. Right now, there are many people in a time of transition. It's May, the month of graduations. Whether it's college graduation and you're moving on to a job, a career, graduate school, or maybe a high school graduation, and you're saying goodbye to 12 years of childhood education. You're going to be saying goodbye to the kids that you see, the friends that you see each and every day. You'll have a summer ahead of you. And then it's whatever your next step is, be it college or armed service or a career, somewhere out in the workforce, starting something new. But that's the thing. You're starting something new. Sometimes our transitions are thrust upon us. Sometimes we choose them. Sometimes they are the natural progression like a graduation. For these disciples, this next step was not how they anticipated it working. It was not something that they planned to have happen the way that it did. So what do they do now? Well, Peter's going fishing. And some of those disciples said, we'll go with you. And that makes sense, right? Return to something normal. The disciples have just been through this huge trauma, this horrible disruption in their very exciting ministry. Maybe they're looking forward to things going back to normal. Maybe they're uncomfortable in it, but they don't know what else to do. If you've ever attended an Al-Anon meeting, you may have been told that when a crisis happens, you go back to whatever you were doing. If you're doing the dishes and your spouse comes home drunk and needs care or is disorderly or you're disappointed or the scene suddenly changes, the dishes are in the sink. You go back to doing the dishes. You go back to what you were doing. You grab on to that sense of normalcy, right? Like the disciples, we too have experienced trauma and disruption. We too want to go back to the way things were before COVID hit. 
How many times when in the beginning of 2020, when this was first happening, were we talking about when we go back to normal? I think it took us a while to realize we're not going back to the way things were. And then this catchphrase, the new normal, started being thrown around. We need to find our new normal. Well, after two years of being in this pandemic, and it's not over yet, after two plus years and some time still to go as we transition from a, a time of pandemic to a time of an endemic illness, virus, we're not going back to the way things were. And I don't even know if I like that phrase, the new normal. Things have changed. Things are different. But the world keeps spinning. We do keep going on. Things are still happening. The schools are still working. The churches are still worshiping. The businesses are still going. Life is moving on, whether we want it to or not. So we just need to decide how are we going to keep our feet moving? What's next for us? So for the disciples, it's going fishing. I mean, they probably need food. They probably need money. They probably aren't really sure what their next steps are. But Peter was a fisherman. Remember when Jesus first encountered Peter, he was fishing. And Jesus said, follow me. And, and Peter put down the, his oars and got out of the boat and followed Jesus. Now he has come through all of this. He has come through so much. And he's going back to fishing at least for tonight. So the disciples get into this boat. They're going fishing. Archaeological studies tell us that boats back then were long enough, big enough to accommodate that many disciples and go fishing. There was a boat that was found that was 2,000 years old, found on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and that boat was 26 feet long. So perhaps this was a similar boat Perhaps this is, we could look at that and catch a glimpse of where the disciples were, what their boat looked like. So they're in this boat, so they've gone fishing, they're trying to return to normal. It doesn't tell us anything about the conversations that they may have had or not had. As, as they were trying to fish, they're not catching anything. Early in the morning, they see a man on the shore. Now they're 100 yards out. It's early in the morning, so we don't really know how light it is, but of course they just see a figure. They don't recognize it as Jesus. And this figure, this man, this person calls out to them, got any fish? No. So this man says, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. And when they did, they had so many fish, they couldn't even bring it up into the boat. And then one of the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, says to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, Peter was dressed casually. Some translations say that he was naked. Others just say he had a, a light bit of clothing on. Regardless of what he was actually wearing, he grabs his outer garment, he throws it around him, and he jumps into the water. So Peter, isn't it? So Peter, enthusiastic Peter. Peter who stepped out of the boat and walked on the water, throws his garment on and jumps in. Doesn't wait for the boat to travel that hundred yards. He goes right in. He goes to Jesus. And the other disciples, they follow behind in the boat. They're towing this net full of fish. And they come these hundred yards. And when they land, they see a fire of burning coals. There's fish, there's bread. They're going to have breakfast on the beach. And Jesus tells them to bring some of the fish. And so Simon Peter, again, so Peter, runs to the boat, brings some fish, there are 153 fish. That's a pretty exact 
number. And interpreters have argued for centuries about the meaning of that number, 153. There's really not a definitive answer to that. To that. Some people think that that specific number is to show that this is an actual eyewitness account. Other people suggest that it was the number of nations in the known world at the time that John was writing his gospel, an indication that God's abundance extends to the whole world. Another theory is that this was the number of species of fish that were known at the time of John's writing, meaning that God's abundance includes all of creation. Some suggest that it was the number of baptized believers who were part of the community to which John wrote. Lots of theories, no definitive answers, but regardless of what theory you believe, the overall message is clear. God's abundance is there. God's abundance is overflowing in more than we could possibly ask or imagine. God's abundance is such that you go from no fish after fishing all night long to a net that is so full, it contains 153, full almost to bursting so big they can barely even haul it in. This is God's abundance. You go from empty nets to bursting full, from no fish to 153 big fish. And now they're about to have some of that fish. I always love to picture that scene on the beach. Just imagine it. Jesus is standing there waiting. There's a fire, there's some fish. There's some bread, the boat comes up, the fish is so fresh, they can cut it and clean it and cook it right then and all sit and have this meal together. You can almost smell the fish cooking, you can almost hear the lapping of the waves, probably just tiny little swish of the water. And here is the Lord. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. This makes me guess, again, guess, because I wasn't there, that this man on the beach might not have looked like the Jesus that they knew, the friend with whom they traveled. Perhaps Jesus appeared as somebody else. As often is the case, we often have encounters with people and we can catch a glimpse of Christ in them. Often we are those people. We are the disciples who are doing the work in the world and people can catch a glimpse of God at work in us. So here they are gathered together and Jesus pulls Peter aside. After everything they'd been through together, Jesus and Peter had a heart to heart about Peter's calling. After being called to be a disciple about called to be a disciple about 3 years before on that very lakefront, after all the miracles, the parables, the healings and the teachings, after the transfiguration on the mountain, after washing Peter's feet on the night of his arrest. After that arrest, after Peter's denial, his denial that he made three times, after the crucifixion and the death, even after finding the empty tomb, Peter still needed some final teaching. Jesus asks Peter three times. This is a chance for Peter to be redeemed for each of the times that he had denied him. Peter, who is, I said earlier, this is just so typical Peter. Peter is impetuous. He's a man of action. He doesn't just sit around. He speaks. He acts. He doesn't always get it right. But he gets a lot of it right. A young rabbi from Nazareth walks by and says, follow me, and Peter drops the oars and steps out and follows. He goes on a mountaintop with Jesus, James, and John and blurts out, we need to build something. We'll mark the spot. We'll build tents here. We can stay. 
He objects to Jesus washing his feet. Jesus alludes to the fact that one of them will betray him, and Peter demands to know which one of them is the traitor. When Jesus predicts that they will all abandon him in the hours ahead, Peter objects, not me. Everyone else might run away, but I, Lord, I will be with you till the end. I will die with you if need be. And Jesus knows. Jesus says, before the night is out, you'll deny me too. You'll deny me three times. Hours later, when the guards come to arrest Jesus in the garden where he is praying, Peter alone resists. He draws his sword. He strikes back. He cuts the ear off of one of the guards. That was the moment. Passion in full force. He would have fought and died for Jesus in that moment, but Jesus stopped it and said, put your sword away. And when they tied Jesus' hands behind his back and led him away into the night, all of them, including Peter, backed away a few careful steps and then turned and ran into the night. It was Peter who followed along. It was Peter who held close by. And yet it was Peter who did deny him three times. A woman recognizes him. She sees him and says, don't you know don't you know him? No, not, not me. I don't know him, he said. Yeah, I'm sure you know him. He says, no, nope, not me. He's asked a third time. He denies him a third time strongly with a curse. That is when the rooster crows and Peter realizes that what Jesus has told him has come true. Full circle back, back to the fishing boat back to his old life, back to normal, crafting a new normal, right? And he jumps out of the boat to follow Jesus once again. And here he is presented with this opportunity. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? You know that I love you. He is adamant. And Jesus says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. If you love me, take care of the whole flock. Right? Don't, don't just say you love me. Show me and show it by taking care of all of my children, all of my sheep. And he says, you know, when you were younger, somebody you would dress yourself and go out. When you are older, someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. He indicates that he knows that Peter will die by crucifixion. Tradition has it that Peter's life ended in martyrdom in Rome, where he was crucified upside down at his request so as not to imitate or replicate the crucifixion of his Lord. Peter the outspoken disciple, the one who jumps into the water, the one who makes mistakes and is forgiven, the one who denies Jesus and is redeemed. We are all Peter at varying times. What is Jesus saying to us? When Jesus says, do you love me, how do we respond? If Jesus were to find you today, to appear before you, to share some fish and some bread with you. If Jesus calls you forward and says, do you love me? I assume we would all say with our words, yes, I love you. Are we listening for Jesus' next steps? Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. Are we showing Jesus that we love him by doing these things? Are we feeding his sheep? Are we caring for his flock? And remember, that means not only the 99 that are in the fold, but the one who has gotten away from the flock. Are we going out and finding that lost sheep? Are we creating a flock that is welcoming enough for that lost sheep to come back into the fold? Are we taking care of the sheep? Are we saying the words without doing the action? Are we talking the talk without walking the walk?
do we love Jesus? And yes, rhetorical, no need to answer. I don't need to hear the words. That is between you and Jesus. But let's see the actions. Also between you and Jesus, but let's let there be actions. Don't just say you love Jesus. Show him. By showing him, you show the world. By showing the world, you introduce them to him. Again, a big circle. The good news is Jesus is asking, do you love me? And we have each and every day the opportunity to answer that question. Each and every day we have opportunities in front of us to show Jesus that we love him. And the best news of all is that each and every day is a new day. So if we screw it up today, we have a fresh start tomorrow. If we aren't loving and kind, if we aren't taking care of the flock today, tomorrow is a fresh new day. And if you don't think that God is a God of second chances, you need to reread this scripture Listen to the story of Peter. Do you know that man? Nope. I, I think you know him. No, mm -mm. Yeah, I swear you know that guy. Nope. And then not too long after that, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes, you know everything. You know I do. Well, then take care of my sheep. Amen. Let us now enter into a time of prayer praying for and with one another. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, we are so very blessed. You heap your blessings down upon us and we are grateful for every time that we have smiled this week, for all of the joy that we have felt, for every time we have caught a glimpse of you at work in the world, even if we didn't recognize it was you until after the fact. For all of these things and more, we give you thanks. For birthdays and gatherings, for all of these many joys, for beautiful rainbows, for the rain that gives the grass and the flowers something to drink, for the sunshine, for the breezes that are starting to warm up and blow a breath of summer into our lives. We are thankful. But Lord, we also have some concerns. We lament, we weep, we have these sorrows, and you are aware of all of them. You hear the groanings of our hearts. You read every prayer request we send out or speak out. And we are thankful that your presence is so steadfast. Lord, there's just so much in the world going on. Diagnoses of disease or illness, painful transitions from something we thought we had to something we're not sure of broken relationships, war, for all of the people in Ukraine, for the people in Russia who don't want the war but are forced to deal with the aftermath, for all of the people who have fled, and for all of the people who cannot flee, for those who are wounded, for those who are grieving, for all of the world leaders involved in making decisions, we pray that those decisions will lead to an end of the war, that the decisions will lead to peace, that there will be rebuilding, not only of infrastructure, but of hearts and souls and relationships and families. Lord, we pray for all of the people across the whole world who are sick, 
in mind, in body, or in spirit. And we give you prayers of thanksgiving for the people who help us become whole again, for doctors and nurses, scientists, researchers, data collectors, vaccine makers. We pray for the counselors and therapists, for the pastors, the Stephen ministers, the deacons, all of the people who work toward our spiritual health, our emotional and mental health, and our bodily health. We pray that you will uplift them and give them the energy and stamina to go on, even in times when it is so wearying. Lord, we pray for all of the people who are at risk of getting COVID, who have COVID, who are recovering from COVID. As we begin a slow but hopeful transition from a pandemic to an endemic state, we pray that we will continue to make wise decisions, decisions that will protect not only our bodies, but the bodies in our community. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of God's people, where the church family is renewed by God's grace. I share these words, they're not mine, they're from a church in South Carolina, but what that pastor says at that communion table is this. This table is very, very wide. It stretches out so far that there is room for all, and all the saints who went before us can gather as well. This table is very, very wide. It stretches back thousands of years into the past and stretches infinitely into the future. And all are welcome. This is not Orange Beach Presbyterian Church's table, your table at your home where you have your elements set up. That is not your table right now. That is the table of the Lord. This is the table of the Lord. And all are welcome at it. Let us pray. We praise you, living God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us and kept that covenant even when we turned from you. Lord, thank you for sending us the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Christ dwelt among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died a human death, then rose to new life that we might live and that all creation may be restored. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup, that they may be for us the bread of life and cup of salvation, and that we may be Christ's body for the world. We pray for this world, that God's peaceable kingdom may come on this earth as it is in heaven. God, we give you thanks for inviting us to know your grace in Jesus Christ, who was bold enough to proclaim the good news, release captives, give sight to the blind, and love all people from all walks of life. And it is in his name that we gather and pray. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat with his disciples. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He poured it, saying, this is a new covenant written in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink this cup, remember me. And indeed, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take your bread or crackers, Take a piece. If you have many people in your household, other people, serve one another. 
saying, this is the bread of life. And then eat and remember. And take your cup, again, serving one another in your household. If you have more than one person, you will serve one another and you will say this is the cup of salvation. Take and drink. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this feast of grace and life. As we have been served, help us to serve our neighbors. As we have been fed, help us to feed all who are hungry. As we have been loved, help us to love the world, because in Jesus Christ, you have loved us. Amen. This concludes our worship service this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next week. We are online every week at 10 a.m. on both Facebook and YouTube. Also remember Thursday evening, we have a prayer service that's on Facebook only. It premieres live uh, so that you can leave uh, prayer requests, joys, concerns. Um, it's a brief 15 minute service, but we would love to have you join us for that time of prayer, uh, music and scripture. But for now, it's time to turn off our phones, close our computers, shut the TV off, and go out and be disciples out in the world, always remembering that we do not go alone. For as we leave, we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.